This morning, we're going to be doing an overview of a 1990 Miata, what's called the NA6. Uh, so this is the 1.6 liter, uh, made from 1990 to 1993. So we're going to be doing an overview here as part of our series, uh, just covering all the important components and some common issues and things to look out for if you're ever working on your Miata. So we'll start over here on the driver's side. Um, similar to most Miatas, you've got the diagnostic port here. On the NAs, most of them have it labeled, which is really nice. It allows you to quickly reference which pins that you want to look at. Um, the labels in here are a little bit cryptic. Um, FP is for fuel pump. That's pretty easy to work out. 10 is for setting your ignition timing. Um, there's a couple others in here that we're not going to cover, but there's excellent uh, resources on Google about that, shorting out pins in order to do some diagnostics. Very useful for DIY projects and uh, figuring out what's going on if you've got an issue on your Miata. So over here, just like on all NAs and NBs, we've got our clutch master cylinder, we've got our brake master cylinder here, and booster. Vacuum powered, just like all of them. Heater core hoses, one of the more common issues. A little bit of a pain. We've got those there, just the same as pretty much every Miata. Uh, the 1.6s are unique, that they have this device here. This is your AFM, or airflow meter, as it's called. Um, basically works the same way as a mass airflow sensor on the other cars, but it is actually a mechanical device that has kind of a trap door in there that as the airflow comes through, it actually pushes that door, you can actually see it on the housing here, it pushes that door open, and the further that that door opens, the more airflow there's getting and it provides more fuel. So works very similar way to a mass airflow uh, sensor on any other car, but it's they can be a little bit finicky, they can have some issues, um, so something to look out for if your car's not running right. Um, there's not much here behind the headlight. You've got the motor itself for the headlight. It does actually have a manual adjustment. If you need to move it up or down, if for some reason it's not working, or you need to adjust something, you can actually rotate this and it will raise and lower uh, the headlight. However, if the power's on, it will fight against you. So make sure you disconnect the power before you do that. Uh, got some connections here for your airbags. Uh, otherwise, not too much going on over on this side. As we come across the front, very standard layout for all the Miatas. Got your radiator here. Got the line going over to your overflow tank. Uh, 1.6s are unique in that they have a temperature sensor actually on the thermostat housing here. So your thermostat's under there and there's this temperature sensor. This is actually the one that controls the fans. So if something goes wrong with this, um, your fans may not work. So it's something we always check for. When we've got cars in here, this wire can sometimes get corroded. And basically, if there's an issue there, um, it can cause your Miata to overheat. Just like all the other versions of Miatas, you got your crossover tube here. It goes from your air intake, which by the way, the filter is underneath there. Just take out a couple of these screws and get to your air filter pretty easily. There's a couple of screws on each side, a couple down at the end. But the crossover tube here takes the air from the air filter and the airflow meter across over to your throttle body. Um, the 1.6s are kind of unique because it is a two-piece design that's removable um, and this side is sort of flexible and we have seen issues where inside in between these grooves here you can get cracks and that basically causes unmetered air to come in through here versus uh, going through the airflow meter and cause the, the car to run lean and have some issues. Um, so that's something that we check on inspections to make sure this is good, this is still flexible, and that there aren't any cracks hidden um, down in between any of those grooves in there. 
I'll come over to the throttle body here. Again, kind of a 1.6 specific thing. There's this little damper on the butterfly mechanism here. And what that's meant to do is when you drop the throttle, it kind of lets it go smoothly. People used to talk about it a lot and say that, you know, if it went bad, it would cause your car to stall when you'd let go of the throttle and things like that. Um, I've never really seen that myself. Uh, I don't really see as much talk about that as I used to. Honestly, I'm not really sure how important that is besides it kind of makes it a little quieter when it closes. So I'm just slapping shut. So kind of a curiosity. And that's something that's not present on any other version of the Miata. So clearly even Mazda realized that uh, wasn't entirely necessary. Um, this little guy here, this is for adjusting your idle speed. It's just a little flathead screw in there. It has a little dust cover over it. Um, on this side of your throttle body, this is your throttle position sensor. It's kind of funny to look back at this early 90s tech and like sort of large sensor uh, for your throttle position, which actually only has three positions. It um, doesn't really tell you how far it's open. It only, it only knows idle, wide open throttle, and then somewhere in between. So it's kind of a basic sensor, just like a lot of things on these early Miatas. There's a little tube here that's very important. It's kind of like an S-shaped tube here. That goes down to the idle air controller. It's a little hard to see, but it connects to that on the bottom side of your throttle body, just like most Miatas. Um, but if this tube, sometimes people forget to connect this or it can get cracks in it, and um, that'll cause your uh, Miata to not run well at idle because it's pulling in again air that's that's unmetered um, Another peculiar thing that's 1.6 specific is This valve on here So this valve is actually an additional uh, idle control setting um, And it's it's a very mechanical device What's actually going on here is these two lines here, these are coolant lines, which again, on 30 year old cars, this coolant line comes down, it hooks to the bottom of the thermostat. You know, just more rubber hoses that have chances to leak. Um, but what this does, it actually runs coolant into this little valve, and the valve that's in there is very similar um, to the valve that's in the thermostat. So based on the coolant temperature, the valve will move and there's actually channels in here that sort of bypass the throttle body and it works the way like an idle controller would and so when the coolant is cold this valve is open allows some extra air and helps uh, the engine run more smoothly and uh, raises the idle a little bit when the engine's cold and then as the coolant heats up it will close the valve and uh, then bring the idle down just to be controlled by the normal uh, idle control valve so it's kind of a strange thing um, we've torn into a bunch of them you know looking you know for possible issues on uh, on cars that were having problems and we have we've never really found a problem with one they seem to be pretty robust um, they also close pretty early uh, we've played with them putting them in the freezer sort of looking at you know what temperature they um, that they close off and it it seems to be around like room temperature 70 80 degrees um, You know, they don't really you know, on a summer day You know, they don't really do anything on a cold start on a summer day um, It's kind of more of a winter thing a lot of people don't even drive their Miatas in those kind of temperatures anyway, so but definitely kind of a curious thing and um, That's what it does then we've got on here, we've got your fuel pressure regulator. Uh, this is something that's unique about NAs versus NBs. Um, they actually have the regulator right on the rail. NBs, it's in the tank. Um, so it's pretty rare, but we have seen these go bad. Um, so you can see they're pretty easy to service. Pretty inexpensive if, um, if you're having a fuel pressure issue. Um, over here on the back of the engine, it, Right here is the cam angle sensor, kind of hidden back there, that four wire plug. 
and there's a bolt on the side of it there that's used for adjusting it. So that's how you adjust your timing. Um, you'll loosen up that bolt and then just kind of grab onto it and rotate it. Just a few degrees makes a, a big difference. And um, you'll do that using the diagnostic port on the other side to set the timing to 10 degrees. And then use a timing light on the, um, the actual crankshaft pulley. And that's how you set your timing. Over here on the passenger side, again, very similar Miata layout. We've got our windshield wiper motor here, just the one motor, some linkages that runs both of the wipers. We've got our fuse box up here. It's a little hard to open because they always hit the wiper motor. Um, this has got a bunch of your main relays. Um, it's got your fuel injection relay. Um, and a bunch of the main fuses uh, for the fuel injection and cooling fans, a couple other things, airbags. Um, there is another uh, fuse box located underneath the, um, underneath the dashboard on the driver's side, and that has kind of all your smaller fuses uh, for interior lights and, and radio and things like that. This is kind of just the, the big main ones. Um, this is a, a 1.6 specific uh, unit here. This is what's called the igniter module. Um, this is an important part of controlling uh, the ignition coils, which are back here, a little bracket on the back of the valve cover. Um, these, fortunately, we don't really see a lot of issues with these, um, but it's something, you know, if you're not getting spark, and you know maybe you've already replaced the coils and you've checked a bunch of other things um, this is something that does control the spark um, normally when we have a car that doesn't have spark it's because of the cam angle sensor which is on the the back of the motor there that that controls the fuel and the spark um, there is no crank position sensor on a 1.6 engine um, so usually that's the first thing that we go to if you have no no fuel and no spark. Um, that's usually the, the first thing to look at. Um, the front of the engine is pretty much the same as every Miata. Got your power steering pump here. Um, all Miatas have this too. There's a little wire going here, which is for a pressure switch on the power steering pump. Helps control things uh, related to the idle and sort of looking for load from the power steering pump, similar to the way it will react to load from the alternator. Uh, we got your power steering reservoir right here. And again, similar to, to other Miatas, over on this side, we've got the uh, AC lines going into the cabin there. Got your um, fill ports and pressure ports here. Uh, right here is your fuel lines. So these on, a, on the NA Miatas, it is a return-based system. That is to say, the fuel comes up, goes uh, through the rail, through the regulator, and then the excess um, gets returned back to the tank. Um, NBs are returnless, so there's only one line um, that comes up from the tank, and the regulator is in the tank. Um, so on these, sometimes um, there's confusion. If these get hooked up backwards, uh, the car won't run, the regulator won't let the fuel flow backwards, um, so it's a pretty easy mistake to make. Uh, the way that it's easiest to tell is that the one here that goes sort of towards further back, this is the one that's going to the regulator, and so that's the return. It goes through this side, through the rail, through the regulator, and then the regulator drops the pressure and the excess from the regulator is what's returned here. One other thing that I didn't want to miss here is uh, the oxygen sensor on the 1.6 is over here on the manifold right there. It's actually pretty easily accessible from the top side, which is nice. Um, it is a single wire sort of a rudimentary 
early 90s style oxygen sensor and that connector comes up from the back here and it goes around and the connector is actually on top of the valve cover here. So pretty easy to do if, um, if you have an issue with your oxygen sensor. All right, we're gonna head underneath the car. So here we are on the underside of the car. We've got the under tray removed. So we can see what's going on under here. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is that this being a 1990 is a short nose crank. So if you're unfamiliar with that, um, in 1990 and half of the 91 model year have what's called the short nose crank. Uh, the second half of 91 and then through to the end of the 1.6 and 93 all have the long nose crank. Um, the difference is that the crankshaft itself has a little bit smaller end on it and the bolt that goes into it is also smaller. Um, and this really isn't a huge problem. Um, it gets a lot of negative attention. People get very worried about it. Um, the problem is with the smaller bolt and the smaller end on the crankshaft, it's a little bit more susceptible um, to coming loose and wobbling around, which can cause issues with the timing belt. It can actually cause the end of the crankshaft to snap. Um, the reality of the situation is if, if the car is properly cared for and you follow the, the directions, when removing and installing the pulley, it actually isn't that big of a problem. Um, if you over torque it or under torque it, you can either snap it or it can come loose, but that's the same on almost any car. Um, even lots of other Miatas, we've seen pulleys that are loose, causing it to wobble and bend the crank or cause issues to the crank. Um, we've seen actually just about as many on 1.8s as we have on short nose 1.6s. So, if you follow the directions when you're doing a timing belt or whenever you have to take that pulley off and that, the pulley right here and then there's a bolt on the inside of it um, the torque spec for the one point or for the short nose is about 80 foot pounds um, versus 120 on the long nose and we always use a little bit of loctite as well just to make sure that it stays tight but if you follow the torque specs use loctite we haven't had any issues um, on cars that we've worked on. So um, I think a lot of times it's just, they're a little more sensitive to, uh, to careless maintenance. Um, but like I said, all cars are sensitive to careless maintenance. So not, um, not really the end of the world, but it's, it's easily identifiable by these four slots, these four long slots. The, the long nose will have eight slots. Here's a little better view of an engine we've got laying around at the shop. This one is a short nose crank as well. It's pretty easy to spot the four large slots in it versus a long nose crank will have eight. Otherwise under slots. here it's pretty similar to every other Miata. Suspension is interchangeable um, pretty much from anything uh, from 1990 to 2005. Control arms, um, tie rods, uh, all that stuff, subframes. So you got your subframe here, lower control arm, upper control arm, tie rod, inner and outer. Got your steering rack here, your AC compressor right there, alternator on the passenger side. Uh, the oil filter is kind of hidden back here. We'll get another shot of that. Kind of see your starter just barely back there. And from the underside this way, got your AC lines here. Uh, if you're replacing the radiator, it's easy to forget um, that there's two little bolts here that hold the, the AC lines onto the radiator. Just take those off and uh, the radiator comes right out. AC condenser on the front side here. Transmission. Uh, the transmissions are interchangeable um, between all NA and NB Miatas. There are three different versions of the five speed um, that are all virtually identical, but have some slight differences. Um, and then there's of course the six speed. And again, they're all interchangeable. Um, 
between all the model years. So you see a lot of people doing six speed swaps or, um, you know, that sort of thing. I hate that part. Okay. A couple important components here on the transmission. Um, you got your speedometer cable right here. These have a tendency to go bad um, if you're getting your speedometer that's shaky as you're going along. Um, that's caused by the cable. Sometimes the cables will actually squeak or make some annoying sounds. Um, it's relatively easy to replace. It just kind of goes up uh, to the firewall up there, goes through and into the back of the cluster. Um, pretty straightforward repair. It uh, hooks right here into the side. Uh, this is on, on all NAs. They have a cable. Um, NBs actually went to an electronic sensor. Um, so you'll see basically in the same exact position. And if you are swapping a transmission from an NB into an NA, um, you can just remove this and plug it into the, the NB transmission um, to basically convert it to run on a cable. Super straightforward. Uh, as long as you save this piece from the transmission, make sure you don't throw that away. The, uh, the actual little 10 millimeter bolt here and that, that plate kind of holds the gear in place that, uh, that you need. Um, over on this side, you have the reverse sensor right there. Um, that is part of an interesting repair that we've done a few times where um, the car can get stuck in reverse and that's actually quite solvable if you take that sensor out kind of stick a screwdriver in there and you can actually uh, move one of the linkages internally that kind of gets dislodged and um, you can actually solve that problem without even taking the transmission out of the car. Um, so we've done that a couple of times. Um, the next one that comes through, we'll make sure to do a video on that. It's, it seems like you need a new transmission, but it's actually pretty solvable. Um, over here, we've got the slave cylinder right there. Um, these are the same for all, all NAs and NBs. Um, it's a, it's something that's kind of a common issue. Pretty easy to replace if it starts leaking. Usually leaking is basically the, the primary issue that they have. All right, moving back. Um, you got your power plant frame here. Same thing on, on all NAs and NBs. They're all interchangeable. Uh, just supports the, the back of the transmission, and then it supports the, the front end of the differential there. As we move towards the back, we've got our exhaust, we've got the downpipe here. Comes along to the back, we've got the catalytic converter. Um, on NAs, it's kind of interesting, the catalytic converter is completely removable um, if you needed to replace it or uh, even delete it. There's, you just got a flange on each side. So it's pretty easy uh, to pull that out and replace if you ever needed to. Um, on on 1.6s, there's no uh, secondary oxygen sensor. Uh, most of the Miatas right in this area would have a secondary oxygen sensor. Uh, being an OBD1 uh, vehicle, the onboard diagnostics are much simpler. Um, and so there is no secondary oxygen sensor. So don't need to worry about that, which also does mean if your catalytic converter goes bad, it won't set a fault, it won't let you know. Um, so to some people that's a bonus, uh, but that's just how 1.6s are. Uh, the, the prop shafts for 1.6s are a little bit different. They're slightly different length than on uh, 1.8s. Um, and that's because the differential itself is actually slightly different length sort of sits a little differently back here. Um, it's very common people will swap a 1.8 differential into a 1.6. Um, they're a little bit stronger and you have better options. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail today on the, the different versions, um, but there was no Torsen uh, style differential available in 1.6s. So you see a lot of people, if they want the Torsen, you grab one from a 1.8, um, you take the shafts, from 1.8 and uh, the drive shaft as well from the 1.8. But you can reuse the, the PPF. Uh, it mounts the same way into the subframe. 
it's a relatively straightforward sh uh, swap, but you do need um, both the, the prop shaft and the two half shafts um, in order to do that. Similar to every other NA and NB, um, got some very important wiring here that runs along the PPF. That goes up to your starter, as well as uh, carrying power to the front of the vehicle, as of course the battery is in the trunk. Um, very important ground here on the PPF. Uh, that's something that sometimes gets corroded or has issues. Um, easy to overlook, being kind of hidden under the car here, uh, but that's very important to make sure that that's in good condition, especially if you're having electrical issues. Um, the rear end is again interchangeable, all NAs and NBs. Um, control arms, of course we've got our lower control arm here, uh, upper control arm up there. We've got our shock, uh, disc brakes, just like on on all, uh, all Miatas have rear disc brakes. Exhaust system, pretty similar. It is not interchangeable between the, the NA and the NB. Um, some of the mounts are different and um, these can sometimes be annoying because there's no flange back here. Um, the NBs actually have a flange which makes it easy to kind of drop part of the mid pipe and leave the muffler in place depending on what you're working on. So it can be a little bit more annoying but overall um, basically the same layout but again not interchangeable uh, between NAs and NBs mostly because of the uh, mounting positions, the hangers and that. Um, this is one that we didn't talk about in the other videos, but right here is the fuel tank. Really tucked up in here, uh, kind of sits above the subframe. Uh, there is a drain here. Um, not all Miatas have a drain on the tank. It can be very handy if you've had a car that sat for a long time. Uh, it can be very useful to be able to drain the tank. Um, and it's... It's a funny thing we've seen on a lot of older Japanese cars, where like in the early 90s they had drains on the tanks, but then in the, the later years they kind of went away from that, which is, for a DIY person, is pretty disappointing, because otherwise it makes draining the tank pretty difficult. Um, you can use that diagnostic port um, under the hood to jumper the fuel pump. So that's a way that we've done it uh, with success. You disconnect one of the fuel lines, jumper the fuel pump, and um, you can actually just pump the tank right out into a, uh, into a can. Uh, along the side here too, we've got, these are the, the brake lines and fuel lines. So these are important. Uh, they are kind of protected here by this part of the, the chassis. Um, but those are something it's actually somewhat uncommon um, to have issues, but on a rusty car, sometimes those can rust through and, uh, and give you some issues, but that's where the majority of those pass through and then they go up um, under the end. You come bay. along to the passenger side here, kind of go through the wheel well. There's a nice little access port through here. Um, this is again, similar on all NAs and NBs. You've got pretty nice access. You've got the starter motor there um, got the, the top side of the slave cylinder, pretty easy access. That's the bleeder there on the right side of it. If you need to bleed the system, especially if you end up replacing it, you'll have to do that. Um, you can see the oil filter there. Access is a little tight, um, but we found this is the best way is kind of come through the side here from the bottom and over there, there's a big gray object. That is the oil pressure sensor. Um, that's a 1.6 specific. Uh, technically also 1994 1.8s have the same one, um, but it's basically a 1.6 thing where they have a real oil pressure sensor. Um, a lot of the other cars, actually all of the other cars, um, it's kind of a fake gauge that's in there. Um, you know, it shows high and low and medium and all that, but it, it's really just an on-off switch triggered at about nine PSI. Um, this one on the 1.6 is an actual gauge um, that gives you real readings, um, which is, is pretty useful. They do sometimes have issues um, and they are difficult to get in there as you can see, uh, but that's, that's where that's located. 
And um, as you can see in there, there's no oil cooler on the 1.6s. Uh, the 1.8s have one kind of sandwiched between the filter and the block. Um, All right, well, that concludes our overview of this 1990 Miata, uh, the NA6. So it covers 1990 to 93 model years. And uh, we're gonna be doing a series right now. We already have one up on the NB1, 99 and 2000. And um, we're gonna be doing uh, the NA8 and the NB2 as well coming up. So please follow along and uh, subscribe to our channel and uh, look for those updates. Thanks for watching.